live on uh, YouTube. Um, so hi to everybody and uh, welcome to our webinar this evening uh, called A Voice for Global Citizens Road Roadmap Towards a World Citizens Initiative. Um, and before we get started, I just uh, need to explain a little bit how this um, discussion will work. Um, so as you've seen, this is a Zoom meeting and not a broadcast or a webinar. Um, which means that we really see this as a discussion and um, not a lecture. Um, we will have a short introduction followed by a presentation from our speakers and afterwards we will open the question, uh, the floor for questions. Uh, so you will have a possibility um, to ask everything you want. Um, for now, all participants are automatically muted uh, so that we don't have too many background noises and we ask you to keep it that way um, during the speaker inputs. Um, or while other people are talking, but you can unmute yourself um, to ask a question afterwards. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can use the chat or raise your hand. There's an option for that in the participants window somewhere on your toolbar. Um, and for those of you who are following along on YouTube, um, it is possible to ask your questions there as well. Someone from our team is following there and we'll uh, make sure that we get the questions here. Um, so for now, we are very, very happy to see uh, how many people signed in um, to join us for this webinar. Our Zoom room is uh, almost full. Um, and we wanted to get started just with a little bit of background. Um, so from Democracy International, um, together with Democracy Without Borders and Civicus, um, a little over a year ago, we actually launched the We the People's campaign. Um, and we really see it as part of a bigger civil society push for a more inclusive and democratic global governance. Um, in this global interconnected world that we live in, we see that we are increasingly confronted with challenges um, that are too big for single, for single states um, to find solutions to. Uh, we can only do something about climate change or about mass extinction if we all work together, uh, for example. Um, and I think especially in the last year, as we are going through a global public health crisis that I'm sure each and every one of you is affected by, um, I think we've all felt how important uh, international multilateral cooperation uh, really is. Um, and of course, the UN, the United Nations is the prime arena for that. Um, but at the same time, what we also see um, is that what is important to states is not necessarily what's important to citizens and vice versa. Um, so the issues that matter to citizens don't always make it onto the global stage uh, where they can be addressed. Um, and this disconnect between global governance um, at the UN, but they're certainly not the only ones where this is an issue. Um, it, it, the same goes for different institutions, um, but this disconnect between them and the people they represent um, is really the issue that we wanted to, um, to look at. Um, and so last year in 2020, we actually, I don't know um, if many of you know this, we celebrated the 75th anniversary um, of the United Nations. Um, and we saw this as the opportunity to, um, to put this disconnect on the agenda and um, to suggest what we think uh, would be a, a possible solution for this or, or one tool in a toolbox. Um, a citizens initiative um, for the UN. Um, and so in a little over a year, we managed to build a really broad civil society coalition uh, with over 300 or around 300 organizations from around the world. Um, and I think this really shows that it's an instrument that speaks to people ima people's imagination. Um, I think that's also why so many people have joined tonight. Um, and it also has to be said, really, that um, the UN themselves took the 75th anniversary as an opportunity to take stock um, not only of what, what has been accomplished in, in these decades, um, but also um, to see what citizens and what people, real people around the world, really expect from the UN. Um, so in 2020, they, they carried out a series of consultations, debates, surveys, um, that reached in total over um, 1.5 million citizens in all UN member states um, to collect inputs. Um, and they've collected all of this in a, a report that they published last month, the UN 75 report, and we will post a link to that in the chat. Um, and so what, what became clear from all of these discussions that they've had and all of these inputs um, is that most people, 97% of people think that international cooperation is something that is really important and something that we need to address the issues that we face today. 
Um, but also uh, a majority of people feel like the UN is far from their lives. Um, and so there really is a need to make this UN more democratic and more inclusive. Um, and the interesting, is that the interesting thing is that the report also identifies ways to do that. Um, and I mean, one way, for example, would be um, to reform the Security Council. This is something that we've heard a lot. Um, but one thing that they've also, that, so that the UN includes in their own report, looking to the, f to the future of the UN, is a possibility of introducing a citizens initiative, right, or a consultation tool at the General Assembly, uh, which is, of course, exactly what we've been calling for. Um, and so given that there's this really great momentum at the moment, uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to, to have a closer look at what such an instrument could look like, how it would work, if it's feasible. Um, and so, yeah, so that's really what we want to do uh, tonight. And before we really dive into that, I would briefly like to give the floor to my colleague, Daniela Vansink, uh, who's our European Program Manager at Democracy International, um, and who can tell us a little bit uh, why a UN World Citizens Initiative is actually not a crazy idea uh, at all. So Daniela, if you're there, please go ahead. Yes, thanks, Caroline. And hi, everyone. Good. Good evening or good day, depending where you're um, tuning in from. Uh, so as you probably know, the World Citizens Initiative is directly inspired from a tool that already exists, and that's the European Citizens Initiative. If you're based in the EU, I hope you know a little bit about it, uh, but we'll hear a lot more from our experts uh, about just how much the structure of the World Citizens Initiative could resemble uh, the European Citizens Initiative. But just to put this all um, into perspective, it's it's really not just the tool that um, of the World Citizens Initiative that's inspired by the ECI, it's the campaign itself too. Um, the campaign for a World Citizens Initiative is really inspired by uh, the civil society campaigns that brought us the European Citizens Initiative that we have now today. Um, so a little bit of a, of a history lesson for you all. Back 20 years ago when the European Citizens Initiative was just an idea, just, uh, just a campaign, it was pushed and supported by democracy activists and civil society. And it was actually those uh, very founding members of Democracy International 20 years ago, uh, before we were even an, an officially registered association that were lobbying uh, for the introduction of what we know today as the European Citizens Initiative uh, in the current treaty of, of the EU. Um, so with that, I, I just want to say that we, we've been here before, we've, we've done this before, we have this, this experience. And as civil society, we've, um, we've pushed ideas that may have sounded too good to be true at the time, but um, in the end with strong and organized civil society support, a really, um, an idea can really become an, an, a reality. So uh, there is this, this potential of power in this idea that we're discussing today, a world citizens initiative. Um, and, and we're already off to a really great start as Carly mentioned with, um, in just our first year over 300 NGOs joining the Alliance already. So. It may just be one day that in the future we'll realize these were the times that were helping shape that that history. Maybe starting with this um, this webinar, you're you're part of history right here. Um, but we we hope it won't take uh, ten or twenty years this time to make the idea come to life. We have a lot of uh, lessons learned from the years campaigning for a European Citizens Initiative, so we know a little bit about what to expect. Um, but without uh, taking up more of your time, um, yeah, I would really look forward then to an interesting webinar and to hearing from our from our experts and uh, to hearing from your questions. So thanks again for your interest in this idea. Yeah, and then so, um, thanks Daniela. Um, yeah, so the first thing we uh, we did when we, uh, when we came up with this idea is uh, we looked for two experts who could really help us um, create a blueprint uh, of, of this instrument. Um, and so uh, we were very lucky um, to have the, the assistance and the help of uh, Dr. James Organ and Dr. Ben Murphy of the University of Liber Liverpool, um, who are here with us today. Um, and they've really um, written this whole plan of how this could work, uh, how we can get there, um, down in a, in a really great study, which we will also publish um, in the chat, which is available um, for download on our website. Um, and so Dr. James Organ is an expert on the European Citizens Initiative and Dr. Ben Murphy is an expert on international law. And so together they make really um, a great team to talk about citizen participation um, at the UN. Um, so I would give the both, the both of you the floor now. I'm not sure uh, who wants to, um, to kick off. And um, yeah, so yes, please welcome uh, Dr. James Organ and Dr. Ben Murphy. Um, thanks so much, um, 
Caroline, and thanks to the um, organisers of the um, webinar. Um, can you hear me okay? Just checking. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting us to, to reflect on the, the potential legal feasibility of, of establishing and, and implementing um, a mechanism such as um, a citizens initiative at the UN level. Uh, it's a great time to um, embark upon such a reflection just over a year after the, the launch of the, the campaign and as the campaign continues to move on at, at such fantastic um, pace. As, as Caroline said, um, James and I come to this question from slightly different um, perspectives. Uh, among many other things, James is an expert on the European Citizens Initiative and citizen participation at the um, European Union um, level. Um, I am predominantly an, an international lawyer and I, and I hope to bring um, some insights into the, the institutional dynamics um, that might be at play in, in implementing a, a World Citizens uh, Initiative. Uh, James and I have, have used this distinction in allocating our responsibilities uh, this evening. Uh, essentially, I will speak to the to the why and the and the how of establishing a, a World Citizens Initiative, the, the context we might say. Uh, and James will will speak more specifically to to the what. What 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 is a, a World Citizens Initiative? Drawing on his um, European Citizens Initiative experience, how can it be implemented, and and what challenges might it face? Uh, for those of us who are in a rush, though, um, the headline is this. Um, notwithstanding um, the obvious legal and political challenges that an initiative like this um, might face, we do not conclude that these challenges are, are insurmountable. So to the, to the context, um, the, dem the, the democratic deficit that a World Citizens Initiative would respond to speaks directly to the issue that attracted me most to this project. International organizations like the UN are sometimes described as Frankenstein monsters. These monsters are created by states, but they take on a life of their own. The Frankenstein metaphor works to an extent because the same creator states sometimes struggle to keep hold of the organization. But the Frankenstein metaphor misses, misses an important point. And that is that the new life that international organizations take on have a particular impact on individual citizens. Think only of the UN Security Council. The UN Security Council's counter-terrorist sanctions regime, um, whereby um, the Security Council um, decides to place an individual on a terrorist sanctions um, list. Um, the Security Council can freeze your assets, seize property, impose a travel ban. Um, but neither me or you as individuals or even our host state on behalf of us has any real capacity to petition the Security Council to give reasons for why we might be on such a list or even to re remove the ban. Now, the UN also has the capacity to wield power in really positive ways and to contribute towards human progress. Think only of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a landmark moment in international human rights protection. Think only of the UN state sustainability development goals. But the common denominator here is key. Whether impacting upon individual lives in a negative or a positive sense, it doesn't cut both ways. The same individuals very rarely have any direct input into international organizational decision-making practices. In some ways, this is the only way that it could traditionally have been. International law is the law that's made um, by states, about states. International organizations are traditionally seen to be intergovernmental in nature. However, in an era when more direct forms of democracy are gaining influence in a range of different contexts, it's becoming increasingly clear that the idea that the UN operates through a veiled form of representative democracy i.e. our governments represent us and act on our behalf, doesn't seem to ring true. This paradox was captured very well by the expert report on the UN's relations to civil society, the Cardoso report, which outlined the deficits of democracy in global governance and noted that one of the key principles of democracy is connecting citizens to the decisions that affect them 
and ensuring public accountability for those decisions. Importantly, the Cardoso report specifically emphasised the potential role of the United Nations in this regard, arguing that it should be the centre of any efforts to reshape democracy to make it more relevant to individual citizens. To do this, however, as then Secretary General Kofi Annan observed in his Millennium Report, he said the UN must be opened up further to the participation of many actors whose contributions are essential to managing the path of globalization. This idea of opening up the United Nations um, has given rise to a number of different um, projects, uh, not least the idea of a, a world parliamentary assembly as a citizens elected global representative institution and participation as a means of democratizing global governance in, for example, a global citizens assembly. The idea of a World Citizens Initiative should be seen as an additional mechanism to, to complement, not compete against these existing pro processes and projects. I'll very quickly say a few words about the potential challenges that such an initiative may, may, may come up um, against. Um, the first two are, are simply challenges that speak to um, issues of, of um, feasibility or effectiveness. We might look to a challenge of the capacity of, of individuals, right? How much influence can individual citizens really um, wield? But of course, this problem is not unique to the United Nations, but it's, 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 it's unique to, to any initiative that speaks to participatory direct democracy. The second challenge, though, would be one of scale with a global constituency of some 7.8 billion people, it might be difficult for citizens to directly influence policy agendas at the UN level. But I think lessons, really important lessons can be, can be learned here for how the European Citizens Initiative overcame these challenges. The third challenge would be the nature of international law, right? Individuals um, are um, traditionally seen in international law as objects upon whom to bestow rights and obligations and this would need to change um, from um, um, individuals as just having rights and obligations to individuals being genuinely power holders that can influence um, the agenda of the United Nations. That said, um, this idea of individuals influencing power is, is deeply embedded in, in international legal doctrine, not least Article 25 of the um, International Covenant of, on Civil and Political Rights. The logical legal consequence of Article 25, the citizen's right to political participation, is that individuals should be upgraded from mere passive international legal subjects, i.e. individuals that just have rights and obligations, to active individual international legal subjects. The fourth challenge might be the, in, in, the intergovernmental nature of the United Nations. But I think what's lost here when we think of the UN as simply being a forum of states is the very first three words of the UN Charter itself, we the people. It seems that at this stage, the idea of um, citizen participation at the UN starts and ends with those three words in the UN Charter. And a key theme um, underpinning the idea of a world citizens um, initiative would be to give some real meaning and substance to this we the people's idea underpinning the UN Charter. Now, James will speak to the, the various specific stages that a World Citizens Initiative process might take. Um, I will finish then um, by, by zooming in on one particular organ of the, the UN, the UN General Assembly, that I think could be um, the most appropriate um, organ for the, the, the World Citizens Initiative to seek to, to influence. But that doesn't sort of close the door to um, influencing the UN Security Council should um, the particular issue at stake um, um, trigger the Council's um, responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. If the underlying rationale is to influence the political agenda and to encourage states to support a particular proposal, the General Assembly might possibly be the most appropriate forum to discuss a WCI um, proposal because the, um, the scope of the General Assembly's um, 
um, power is not limited in any way. The General Assembly may discuss any matter under the competence of the UN. It has the power to pass resolutions that member states are expected to respond to, but these resolutions are not legally binding. However, the General Assembly is in a position to launch, launch intergovernmental negotiations under the auspices of the UN on new treaties or to put questions in front of the International Law Commission for further um, consideration. There are four ways that a WCI proposal might influence the General Assembly's agenda. And I'll conclude by briefly um, going through what these four ways might be. The first way might be for a World Citizens Initiative proposal to be added to the agenda to be discussed at the initial general debate of each annual session while heads of state and government are present at the General Assembly. This would certainly enhance publicity, but would require the organising committee um, to meet the required timescales and to comply with the procedures of the, the UN General Committee. The second option would be for a World Citizens Initiative to trigger a special session of the General Assembly. It may be, thirdly, that instead of a plenary debate, it would be preferable for the WCI proposal to be discussed in one of the six main committees that cover individual substantive issues within the General Assembly. Finally, and with the most impact, and there's no reason at this stage why we shouldn't be as ambitious as possible, a WCI could potentially oblige um, the UN, either the General Assembly or the Security Council, to draft a particular resolution in response to a proposal and then vote on that resolution. Whilst we can't expect individual member states to, um, to accept an obligation to vote in favour of that resolution, at the very least, a WCI might impose an obligation for that same state to give reasons, an obligation that states do not currently have. Um, at, at this stage, I'll pass over um, um, to, to James, who will talk about more of the specifics. Thanks, Ben. That's great. Uh, risk of going second is, of course, Ben's taken some of my time. But that's, uh, I'm also conscious that there's, uh, there's lots of people here today, and I'm sure there's lots of questions, so I won't speak for too long. Um, Thanks for the over, overview, Ben, from the UN perspective. Um, as Caroline says, we are, our expertise approach these issues from slightly different uh, directions, but there, there obviously is, is overlap. Um, Ben's covered a couple of things that um, I'll come on to later, such as impacts. Um, but what I'll try to do in the few minutes I've got is just to put some flesh on the bones to give you a sense of the, the design that an I, a WCI might have, the sort of regulations it it might have, and how that links back to, to the European Citizens Initiative, the ECI, and the learning that we've, we've, we've got from, uh, from the ECI um, over the years. Um, as we've heard, um, as, as we probably agree, democracy is always, is always evolving at every level, and of course the international level is no exception. Um, our argument is that the WCI, the WCI, the World Citizens Initiative, is a feasible step towards developing the democratic legitimacy of UN decision making. Um, as Caroline said, it's part of a toolbox, it's not a cure for all uh, democratic ills. It's part of that gradual ev evolution of UN democracy and hopefully we'll link into other instruments that come along in the future. Citizens participation through a citizen initiative, fundamentally that, that brings some of the core values of democracy to international decision, decision making. Um, decision making that's currently based on uh, through, through legitimacy through the member states. The European Citizens, Citizens Initiative is the world's first supranational instrument of participatory democracy. There have been lots of that. There are lots of national citizens initiatives, uh, but the ECI is the first supranational one, the first one uh, linked to an international organization, the EU. It's not directly transferable to the, the UN. And James, I'm so sorry to cut in, but there seems to be a little bit of an issue with your microphone. I don't know if you can... Oh, can I put it? Is that better? Much yeah. better. Thank you. That's much closer. Sorry. Um, you've only missed the preamble. So it's, it's, uh, <laughs> um, so all I was saying was the, um, the ECI is not directly transferable to the UN level, but there is, there is um, plenty of learning that we, we, can, we can glean from it. 
Um, and our proposal is that the WCI follows, um, can you hear me better? Is that all right now? Um, so it follow, does follow the sort of agenda setting initiative that we've, um, that the, the ECI has. Um, in other words, the ECI gives citizens a formal opportunity to make a policy or legislative proposal. Um, and that when they reach an agreed level of support, there's an obligation on a political body to respond. Broadly speaking, that's definition of a citizen's initiative. And the ECI is an agenda setting initiative as the WCI will be, means that there's no um, definite obligation imposed on that political body. A lot of it is about influence and uh, influencing the agenda rather than a direct impact on uh, at the decision making stage. So the hope was that the ECI would bring a whole new dimension of participatory democracy to the EU. There is the potential for the WCI to do the same for the UN, but those those high expectations, we should temper them a little bit. Um, there are challenges, which I'll speak to uh, in the next couple of minutes, um, but there have been successes. Uh, we've had six successful ECIs that have reached the million um, signatories needed from uh, a sufficient number of member states. We've had 10 million people sign ECIs, 76 proposals have been made and registered, and all sorts of subjects have been have been covered from the right to water, animal welfare, citizens' rights, vaping, marriage, road speeds, and many, many more. So, so there's, there is the um, desire there from citizens to support these proposals. There's a desire there from people to organise them as well. The three stages, generally speaking, for organising an initiative is uh, setting up the committee, registering the proposal. Secondly, collecting support. And thirdly, submitting your proposal and getting a response from the relevant body. I'll quickly go through each of the, I'll pick out one or two things from each of those um, steps in the process. First, setting up the committee. This committee leads and is responsible for the campaign maintains communication with the authorities, an essential part of uh, smooth progress of, um, of a citizen's initiative. An important point is that it should reflect the polity that it's, the proposal is being made to. So a WCI committee should reflect um, its global reach. An ECI has seven representatives from member states. The World Citizens Initiative, we suggested 10 representatives from um, an equitable geographical distribution, the one set out in Article 23, one of the Charter. Um, that, that distribution is five African or Asian states, one Eastern European state, two Latin American states, and two Western European and other states. How exactly that's decided is, is obviously a question for the UN, but that, that was our proposal, a kind of starting position, starting discussion point. Topics, um, the subject matter um, can be fairly broad for, for the reasons that Ben stated. Um, registration has been a challenge at the EU level, but has largely been worked through. Um, there have been several court cases challenging the Commission's application of registration criteria. Largely worked through, I think that's something that the UN um, can hopefully avoid. Um, registration is an important legal step that gives citizens' initiatives, uh, their official status, elevates it beyond something like um, the status of a petition. Um, but I, I think for the WCI, I don't envisage any problems in, in, in establishing that point. Uh, one key question, though, that I, I, I wanted to raise was whether a WCI should be able to advance reform, uh, significant reform proposals or, or charter changes. How fundamental should citizens be able, what, what level of fundamental change should citizens be able to propose? I, I'm so sorry, James. Did you have to, um, I actually think it's probably better if you make it a bit further away from... Okay. Uh, I, don't know, it's, I don't normally have this problem. I hope it's not something broken. Is that better? It is better, yeah. Thank you. Apologies. No, it's, it's my oh, technology. <laughs> exactly. Um, do stop me if it, if, it, if it gets worse again. Um, Secondly, collecting support for, for the initiative proposals. Lots of administrative hurdles here. Um, identifying how you identify someone as a signatory, electronic systems, verification of signatories, length of collection time, and so on. I'm happy to go into detail uh, in questions. Given the limited time, I'll just, just focus on one, one key question that ben, ben also alluded to, and that, that's the um, 
the level of support you need for a, an initiative to be a success. This is a this is a fundamental question for the legitimacy of these processes. The support deciding the support th threshold is complicated. Need, there's several factors that need to be worked through, um, but in in general. Um, the higher the level of support required, the more legitimate it is for a citizens initiative, for a WCI proposal to have an impact on decision making. So the more, obviously, the more people you have signed for support, the more pressure there is on the political receiving authority to, to make a change. If set too low, the legitimacy um, will be limited. You'll only have a very small percentage of citizens from uh, supporting something and it reduces the chance that unwilling political actors will respond in the way the campaigners hope, even if you have met the threshold set. One of the other factors which then complicates matters is that the higher the threshold you set, the higher you set for legitimacy, um, the more difficult, for example, it will be to collect um, to collect support. So you then have the other trade-off against the practicality of these initiatives. If you set if you set the um, support level at tens of millions of, of citizens globally, it's going to be very hard for campaigners to, to reach that level and have any impact at all, and it could fall into disuse. The EU seems to have set the levels reasonably well. Um, about 0.2% of the EU population, 1 million citizens from seven member states. We tried to set a kind of a slightly similar um, sort of approach, a fairly low total population, but try and have some geographic spread. We tried to set that for the WCI as well. So 5 million citizens is our suggestion um, from the same spread as the organizing committee, five African Asian states, Eastern European states, uh, two Latin American, two Western European states. Um, and we set a core at level at which they, 0.5% um, uh, of the population of that state's population to be um, adding to that number. So we hope that strikes the balance between direct citizens' legitimacy through a total number of citizen support and legitimacy from a sufficient number of member states. So it reflects the member state legitimacy of the UN. Um, I'm running out of time. I won't say too much about impact, but impact is fundamental to this. And it's still an on, this is probably the biggest ongoing issue for the ECI is expectation from campaigners about impact. Obviously, you've, you've gone through a lot of effort to, to, to get a proposal on the table to get the support for it. There's, there's expectations there. Um, on the other hand, there's, there's the necessity for what is actually a relatively small percentage of the population, perhaps, to, to feed into the, the, the policy making and decision making processes. So there are expectations from the, from the policy makers side that they should be able to bring other, other um, concerns to bear. Um, as Ben said, we did put a proposal in, in for how, uh, how a WCI can impact on um, United Nations decision making. Um, so I won't say any more uh, about that. Um, in conclusion, um, the exact design of the WCI will depend on answering those sort of key questions that I've covered, but there are several more. The three that I picked out were, were what subjects are appropriate for a proposal, um, who does that uh, proposal go to, um, the support level we need, and what impact do we uh, expect. Uh, my final point really is that we, we feel this is legally feasible to have a WCI. Um, it will have or certainly has the potential to have an influence on the democratic legitimacy of the UN. But of course, that's if the political will is there to use the WCI to develop citizen participation. Um, and I'll end there. Apologies, Caroline, for the uh, the poor, poor technology. And I hope I haven't gone too far over time. That's fine, no worries. Uh, we could hear you. There was just a little bit of um, background noise or something in the in the meantime. But I think uh, we understood quite well and we have some time still for questions. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, we really see this as a, as a discussion. And, and so this is also the reason that we um, that we plan this as a meeting and not as a as a webinar or a broadcast is that um, we also like to hear from from you the people who've joined us um, and I see a lot of people were already writing in the chat uh, people from all around the world which is really nice some literary tips as well um, but I would really now open the um, the floor um, for questions so if any of you um, have a question uh, feel free to maybe um, raise your hand um, easiest for me is if you use the 
Zoom function for that. Um, and then uh, we will give you the floor. And so we have one question already. Um, please, I hope I say this right, Ufa, please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, hello. And thank you for the, uh, this very nice event. I'm looking forward to take part of this uh, dialogue. I am uh, a board member of the United Nations Association in Denmark. And uh, I have been doing some citizen initiatives, like uh, I have followed the conference on the future of Europe, but I couldn't wait for the EU to start this. So I started one myself called a dialogue about the future of Europe. And I've just made a citizen think tank uh, calling Europe dialogue. But in this dialogue, I would like to focus on Europe and the world. Uh, and I've also created a friendship group, Africa Europe. So I really appreciate this uh, initiative and I really look forward to take part of it. So thank you very much for this uh, event. Ah, thank you very much. So no question, just compliments. Did I get that right? That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much. And, and thank you for joining. Um, I, I think we have another question or comment uh, from Matthew. Please, uh, please go ahead. Hi there. So, so great to be joining you from um, the English East Midlands. Um, a wonderful talk. Um, just to say that I'm the founder of Lib Dem Friends of the, um, of the SDG. So really good to be with you today. My question is, this agenda sounds fantastic. I think it's really important. But aren't many Western democracies turning inwards? Aren't many de de Western democracies becoming nationalist rather than internationalist? Albeit that the United States um, is looking out to the world again. But how does this agenda fit with that inward kind of navel gazing that is going on here in the UK and many other places? Mm -hmm. uh, should we take uh, yes. questions? Should we? Did you want to take questions one at a time, or? or? Yes, I think one at a time is. Uh, we will see how much, uh, how far we get. So, so please go ahead, James, if you want to take that. Yeah, just. A, 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 I mean, that's a, that's a big question, Matthew. Obviously, the, the um, my, my my response would be that I think this is a way of uh, testing that question of international international uh, views, and that if we have some, we have the ECI, if we have. Uh, the WCI, it gives citizens the opportunity to support these proposals and to say, yes, we are interested. We directly as citizens can um, can make that statement on our own basis without necessarily the reliance on, on member states, governments and so on, which, as you said, some are turning inward. Thank you. Um, I believe there was also a question from Colleen. Um, so um, please go. Uh, please go ahead and, and ask us your question. Hello, everyone from Canada. Um, I was uh, thinking about the realization that you mentioned, Ben, about the gap between civil society and the best intentions of the UN. At, from a psychological base, um, one of the, the things I hear in all of the documents I read from the UN and maybe the best intentions of things like uh, coalition for the UN we need, uh, UN 2020 or 2021, maybe it is now. The thing that I keep hearing and I'm thinking that our initiative would need to address right away is what is the nature of the gap? If we just kind of plow ahead and say, well, I think it's this, I think it's that, it's just about connecting resources, services, in a way, there's already lots of that. What I hear more from people is it's the relationships that are not happening. It's the relationships that are not sustainable. It's the deep dive. It's um, what are the deep needs that come up in terrorist activity? For example, in ISIS, the need to belong, brotherhood, being able to shape a worldview. So I'm wondering if that might be a place to begin, like what is the nature of the gap? What are your thoughts? Before we get to... Oh, it seems like, uh, I would like to ask anybody who's not speaking to mute themselves, uh, while yeah, otherwise we have these sort of um, background sounds. Sorry, Colleen, I think you were just rounding up your, your thought there. 
No, I would, I think I was finished that that's often missed. We do needs assessments. We do assessments of many types. We do uh, cultural assessments, but universally, and even in a world's initiative, there is a universal need that any kind of program proposal policy must address. This would be the new, the new um, shift to bring to a UN and show them how it's relevant and show them how it can be measured. Sorry, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, James or Ben, I don't know if you, if you want to um, respond to that. I think it's um, it's a fascinating and really important um, question that Colleen um, raises, um, and um, I, I I don't suggest that here and now um, I, I'll be able to answer such an important question as how can we capture the essence of of the gap. It's one thing to say that that um, citizens don't have um, the don't currently have the legal capacity. Um, to participate participate meaningfully at the the UN to go to that next level and say and say um, why is why is that the case and what actually how do we actually categorize and conceptualize the nature of um, this gap I think it's it's an unbelievably important um, 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 question and um, and um, th the world will be a better place when we get closer to the answer. I guess my small con contribution to that would be that initiatives like this um, create new spaces to have the types of conversations that Colleen wants wants to have, um, because the the intergovernmental state state centric nature of the the UN as it's currently um, constituted simply doesn't create um, a, a a forum to even begin to answer the the, the question. Um, that Colleen is asking. So that, that, that's really the only sort of tiny sort of um, contribution that I could make to such a big um, question. But I also think that that thinking takes us back to um, um, Matthew's question as well. What, where does this type of initiative sit in an increasingly sort of um, nationalistic um, world? Well, on the one hand, um, institutions like the UN simply have to continue to exist however inward facing states want to be because certain global problems will simply not be um, challenges will not be met without cooperation at the, the United um, Nations um, but sometimes I also think that, 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 that one problem doesn't mean that we shouldn't seek solutions in, in, in other ways so while states are acting in increasingly nationalistic ways. Initiatives like this actually provide opportunities to circumvent the state and allow allow citizens to have a direct um, direct influence. Um, but I think um, Colleen's question is really well taken, and it's a question that we should all think more about. I think. Thank you very much for that, Ben. Um, I believe the next person who had a question is uh, Javier. I'm trying my best to pronounce that right. Um, so you can go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your you question. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello from, from Madrid. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful meeting. It has been very interesting for me and I hope for everyone also. I have a, maybe a general question, maybe it's a, mostly general to either a Ben or James. And um, one of them is from a political perspective, and the other one would be more from the legal or institutional perspective. So my question is that given the current veto power in the UN Security Council, and given the fact that the UN Assembly hasn't or hasn't yet a genuine legislative power, unlike the European Parliament, I would like to ask these two questions. First of all, how would this veto power interfere the possible success of any future world citizen initiative regarding, for example, human rights or condemnation of military courts? I am thinking in recent China veto over Myanmar court condemnation in UN Security Council or any other issue. And my second question is more uh, from a legal point of view. 
Uh, given this fact that the UN Assembly has an, a genuine le legislative power, what kind of tangible outcome would have a resolution in UN General Assembly in case of successful World Citizen Initiative? So would it be a mere recommendation, a, some sort of a parliamentary motion, or a non-binding political statement? So this is my, my two questions. Thank you very much. Go first, Ben. Um, yeah, uh, I'll give it a go. Um, <laughs> thank you uh, so much. I think they're really, really important um, questions. Um, we could potentially split the question into, into two. What challenge does the WTI face considering the, uh, the inherent veto power of the, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council? And if we therefore um, um, focus our attention on the General Assembly because of problem number one, how do we overcome the, the non-binding nature of General Assembly resolutions? Um, so considering the, the, the Security Council's veto, um, it will be important when thinking through um, the, the particular reform proposals that a WCI um, campaign makes and to ensure that these reform proposals do not amount to suggestions that we should amend the UN Charter. Um, because um, not only does um, do the permanent members of the Security Council have an inherent veto when it comes to decisions of the Security Council itself, the permanent members of the Security Council also have the veto capacity when it comes to um, reforming the, the UN the UN Charter. However, as sort of James and I um, attempt to show in, in the report, um, that there would indeed be, be, be ways to establish a mechanism such as this um, that would not amount to a formal amendment of the, the UN Charter. Just on this point, though, a... Um, an issue that's often overlooked when it comes to the Security Council um, veto. Um, it's not just when individual permanent members um, veto a particular um, decision because of their own political alliances. What you actually also find is that certain issues, um, and I, I, I might not go as far as to mention the particular issue, considering we're, we're, we're live on, on, on YouTube and the political sensitivity um, of the particular issue I'm, I'm thinking of. But these issues do not even get to the agenda of the Security Council. So there's, certain, there's a particular conflict that I have in, in my mind that would be absolutely the type of conflict that the Security Council would traditionally discuss that never even gets to the agenda of the Security Council because a particular permanent member would veto that. So a relatively modest proposal that the World Citizens Initiative might have would be to say that at the very least a proposal should be discussed within the general within the Security Council, albeit without imposing obligations that the Security Council might take action. To the second point, the, the non-binding nature of the General Assembly's um, power. That's absolutely, absolutely correct. The General Assembly does not have the power to bind individual um, member states. But some um, declarations and resolutions of the, the, the General Assembly, non-binding as they may be, have become some of the more influential um, and, um, and, um, and long-standing um, resolutions in, in the history of the UN. The Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights is a non-binding sort of um, legal instrument of the, of the General Assembly. And think of the influence that the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has had um, on international human rights. Um, protection. And as a final point, the, the nature of international law tells us that whilst these decisions may be political statements legally um, non-binding, they can actually have an, an unbelievable degree um, of influence. So I don't think that is the, the type of hurdle that it, that it necessarily would be in other uh, legal, legal contexts. I think it's a really, really good question. Thanks, Ben. I was just going to add, I mean, that, that is goes to the heart of the debate at the moment about the European Citizens, Citizens Initiative and how far it should be able to go as an instrument to enable groups of citizens to change policy and lawmaking in, in, in the EU. Uh, on the one hand, 
if a lot of citizens support an issue, there's an expectation that um, that initiates a legislative process or has a change on policy. But on the other hand, there may be things that are supported that us uh, by a million and a half people out of the 500 odd million we have in Europe that are actually against the interests of of the majority. So as we do in many democratic um, theoretical situations, we've got this debate between support from a formally approved minority and checking it against the majority um, legitimacy of people across um, across a polity. Uh, and obviously on a global level, that becomes even 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 clearer. Um, but as Ben said, that legal definition of how much impact it should have, and for the for the ECI, for those who aren't aware, the ECI only promises to its campaigners that the Commission will consider, so it will consider making a proposal. So the ECI is only an invitation to act. Um, nevertheless, it's had some influence. I think most Campaigners say it hasn't had enough influence. Most commissioners say it's had a lot of influence. So we, we, we can see this, this kind of gap between expectations on either side, the bureaucracy or the politicians thinking we're responding to the people and listening um, and, the, and the campaigners wanting more influence. And obviously somewhere in the middle, we can come to an agreement and we can make change. Uh, and as Ben was saying, it, it's that political influence. It's the, it's the political um, influence that's brought to bear on these issues. Um, often becomes more important than the actual legal definition of exactly how much impact they can have. Yeah, I think it's it's important to keep um, checking this idea that we have to the, to the reality of an exist of the existing tool um, that we have in Europe and then seeing that, um, that it really does do things, even if it is an agenda setting initiative, um, so it can really still move things. Um, so I believe we have a question from Tad Daily, an earthling in Los Angeles. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. I identify myself that way because where we are does not uh, define who we are, right? So I am, uh, yes, good morning to all uh, from Los Angeles. Um, Tad Daly, I'm a, uh, I guess I've been a policy advisor or speech writer for four different uh, members of the US Congress. Uh, now I work with uh, Citizens for Global Solutions, 74 years old this month. Uh, the venerable NGO. I see our executive director, Bob Flax, is, is with us. Um, I would like to ask about a not dissimilar uh, proposal. I think I know the answer to this question, but I just really want to clarify it. it. It's the idea that I know many of you are not unfamiliar with uh, for creating a United Nations Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, Andreas Bummel, who I see uh, with us, has been the great guru and champion of this idea for many years. Uh, it is the idea that already elected national parliamentarians could sit at a new formally instituted body uh, at the UN uh, under Article 22. And I just wanna clarify that these two proposals are not mutually exclusive, I hope. I hope it's not the case that this New World Citizens Initiative is somehow replacing our civil society advocacy. Uh, and, I, and I hope that the two I hope that those of us who are global governance innovation advocates can and should uh, advance both the proposal for a UN parliamentary assembly and the World Citizens Initiative as two uh, really complementary uh, forces. Thanks. Yeah, um, Ben and James, you're very free to comment on this if you want, but I, uh, I feel like this is also maybe a, a little bit of a question to us from the campaign. And so um, I will just briefly give an input here as well. Um, so yes, we know the we know and we support the, the proposal for a UN parliamentary assembly. Um, as you know, Democracy Without Borders, who have uh, called for that for a long time, um, is, is one of the steering committee members on this campaign. Um, and actually, uh, very shortly, we are planning to launch um, a, an endorsement statement or a call for a more inclusive, more democratic governance um, that that combines both proposals or that that has both proposals and that also calls um, for um, for more civil society um, involvement. Um, so for a UN uh, civil society envoy. Um, so these are absolutely complementary and in our view, um, complementary proposals and um, we should push for all of them. We don't have to compete with each other. Why should we? Um, but James and Ben, if you want to uh, feel free to to add something was, to that. I was going to add something slightly 
not uh, about civil society, slight, uh, tangent, slightly tangential, but civil society has been mentioned a few times by the question. Just, just, just to say that this this is termed as a citizens, a world citizens initiative, but in reality, civil society is is fundamental to this, um, and the space that Ben talked about earlier about that it creates is often occupied by civil society organisations. Um, uh, it, it's a debate. It's a, a, how best to to manage and establish that process is, is, is a key discussion as well. Um, yeah, yeah, we do say in the in the report um, that um, we see no reason at all why um, this, an initiative sh such as this should be seen to be in competition uh, with other uh, existing um, projects. Uh, and if I sort of received a question um, like that in another uh, webinar, um, I'd I'd ring um, um, the brilliant uh, Andreas, and considering we, we we have him in the in the room, uh, I wonder if if you wanted to comment on the relationship um, that you see, um, Andreas. But obviously, don't feel obliged. Oh, am I supposed to respond to that? I think you only can. if you want to. <laughs> Well, I can only repeat what Caroline already said, and thanks for this very good question. These two proposals and campaigns are really completely complementary, and I believe that they are not only complementary, but they also reinforce each other. And that's why I think it's really good, in, in my, from my point of view, that we are trying to synergize the efforts, because it's coming... It's the same goal coming from two different directions. One is participatory democracy connecting to citizens directly. And the other is representative democracy connecting with citizen elected representatives. So I think that in the future, um, we might connect these two things even more than we do now. Yeah, I think uh, a systemic approach to democracy is something I break, you know, that, that would be my argument is, is to, to always think about the system and the, the different aspects, the different instruments, the different opportunities we have as citizens to engage with policy making brings brings its own strengths. Each instrument brings its own um, strengths to the democratic uh, environment in which we live. Um, if this is okay with you, we're going slightly over time, but we have two more questions. I would suggest that um, if, if James and Ben, if you're with us for a little bit longer, that we can just take those questions. Great. Um, so um, I, I see Keith, um, Keith McNeil has his hand raised. Um, so, so please go ahead and, and ask your question. Keith McNeil, I live in Clearwater, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, just speaking about implementing World Citizen Initiative, and just wondering, who do you see as being the um, decision makers on this? Who are the people that say, well, that sounds like a good idea, let's do it. And then how do we reach those people? So uh, I'm not sure that I know the answer. So the, the question was, how do we make this happen? I think, is that right, Keith? Who, do, who, do, who are the, who are the um, that feels more like a campaigning question to me. I'm not. I'm. Um, I, I, ben, do you have do you have an, a sense of? of I mean, my, my my short answer would be the member states. So the UN is is a, is a member state organisation. It's member states themselves that need to decide um, to to make this happen. That's where the political will is going to come from. Um, unfortunately, it feels a bit like. Turkey's voting for Christmas because uh, they're 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 agreeing to give away that with with some agreeing agreeing to give away a very tiny but a, a slither of their power. But as Daniela said right back at the beginning, we, we've been through this process with the ECI. Um, uh, so there's hope that we can persuade member states that this this is beneficial, um, and this does this does you know we hope the member states see strengthening of democracy as beneficial to them and their citizens as well and don't see it as taking away from their power it should be building building the session i hope that was has answered the question to some degree i i would ag agree with, with with james i'd say like um like with any sort of initiative or project like this it's maybe engaging you know, civil society organisations um, um, and, and, and activists to build a momentum towards the key players here, which, as James, you know, 
um, correctly acknowledges would be individual member states. And then when we get to this this um, um, sort of moment, I think the key theme needs to be to show member states that whilst it may be, seem to be, you know, giving away a, a degree of, of member state um, sovereignty, um, the thing that really sort of attracts me to this um, proposal is that it is um, novel um, and innovative, but also modest and to, to the same degree. I, 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 and it's important to acknowledge that a World um, Citizens Initiative would not and could not oblige member states to act in any particular way or vote in any particular way. And it's about sort of explaining and selling that element of the proposal that I think would be so important. Um, it, it's so um, novel, it's so innovative, but it's also um, modest in its own way. And I think it would be important for member states to, to understand that. But again, that, that, as James said, it's essentially a, a, a question to do with the campaign itself. So I don't know if you wanted to, to chip in from that perspective, um, Caroline or Daniela. I could say, yeah, maybe just a quick, I mean, uh, just to uh, reiterate what has already been said, of course, we'll need member states from the one end, but we can't, um, I think we can't expect that politicians, and by politicians, I mean the top level administrations and governments and foreign ministers, even if they like this idea, they're not going to come out and say, okay, we will put in a World Citizens Initiative for the goodness of our heart. It's, we're going to need on the other side, civil society to put, put that push in there and citizens to say, this is something that we want. And I think the, the point that Ben just made, there's nothing to lose. This is not going to be something that will oblige them that will then change the entire structure that's going to be, it could it will be groundbreaking in the, from the citizens point of view, but on the side of the member states, it's not, they don't have much to lose. So I think that if we just, um, we have a hook like this, we just, we say this, this can only bring us further as far as bringing citizens closer to the UN and bringing more trust in, in, into the UN, especially in times when the world has to come together in pandemics, for example, and issues like climate change. I think we can say that there's only benefits for a tool like this to exist. Great, thank you very much, all of you. Um, I believe we have a question from, um, from Jeffrey. Um, he wrote it in the chat box, but you can go ahead and, and ask it. Great, uh, thank you so much. Yes, I'm Jeffrey Huffines, I'm senior advisor for what was UN 2020, now the coalition for the UN that we need. And uh, in fact, I mean, I think as many people know on this call, uh, UN 2020 last year, we were delighted to endorse uh, the idea of a World Citizens Initiative in our UN 75 uh, People's Declaration. So uh, we'll put that in the chat. I hope everyone has a chance to read it. So as my question states, and it kind of, it, 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 it follow, it's in line with, with the conversation we're now having, and that is rather than waiting for the United Nations to endorse this concept, couldn't we as a first step establish a WCI organizing committee independent of the UN that would solicit the petitions, that would uh, develop the modalities to do so to demonstrate its efficacy, and then could identify a group of member states who would agree to carry the petition forward through the UN, either as a GA resolution or a GI, GA high level debate. So in so doing, we would circumvent this idea that we need to somehow get the UN's approval to make this, make this idea happen. I might add also that the coalition for the UN we need, we're very interested in developing multilateral innovation hubs. So maybe this is one idea for such an initiative. Sounds, sounds like an interesting idea to me. Um, and just on, on the EU learning point, it reminds me of the TTIP unofficial ECI. They stepped out, they they used the established procedure that was there and, and then they weren't allowed to register their proposal and they said, well, okay, but we're gonna go and do it anyway. So they collected several million signatures from across the member states, followed all the rules and presented it and, and had an influence on on policy making, so, so yeah, that's that's a, an interesting idea to show it works, um, and through that to 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 try and make the change, U using a framework that we could you know, we can establish and agree on. Good idea. Right. I particularly like that idea. It sounds like a a world citizens initiative in order to start a world citizens uh, initiative. I, I really do um, like that. Um, 
and I also think that there's something to say actually for the exact um, multi-dimensional approach that the that the campaign is taking. You know, in, in events like this, and um, also conversations with individual uh, member states. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea, and it should sit alongside the the multi-dimensional approach that the the campaign is is already taking. But again, it feels like a campaign question, so um, maybe there's space here for others to chip in. Uh, yeah, we maybe that's a. I think that's a great idea. We should <laughs> we should definitely talk about it. Um, yeah, um, I I think we have. Um, I, I, well, we have actually Andreas Bummel who wants to ask a question. So maybe uh, you could also comment on that first. Um, so who's our, our from our partner organization, uh, Democracy Without Borders? Well, I also think that's very interesting. So some member state or a group of member states could volunteer put forward resolutions based on some system that is WCI similar. That's very interesting. But I was raising my hand because I wanted to um, pose a question concerning this other item on how to get it implemented. And it's true, we would need approval of the General Assembly, but this reminded me that in the study that you authored, James and Ben, you said, um, and we discussed it at the time, but you say that there should be a two thirds majority vote in the General Assembly. And I just wanted to get back to that and, and ask, isn't that really a threshold that is too high? Um, again, ask it again um, now after one year, might it not be sufficient if there's just a simple majority vote in the General Assembly? Two thirds is just really very high. So um, I remember our, our discussions at the at the time, and um, Andreas, and I think they were really um, you know important discussions to to have. That, that to my knowledge, that there is nothing in terms of the the um, the practice of the the General Assembly that would in any way suggest that this would have to meet the the requirement for what's known as an important question, which would therefore require the two thirds uh, majority. We we fell on that side of the um, the, the hurdle because we, the, we we were we we were departing from the premise that an initiative that had at, at its heart um, democratic principles should be born from the the highest degree of democratic legitimacy um, um, that was that was possible. Um, but it may well be actually that when we move to the implementation stage, that that is an unnecessarily high. Um, threshold um, to meet and so I would quite sort of comfortably um, um, suggest that it's not a hurdle that would have to be technically met. I absolutely would agree with Andreas on that point, yeah. So James, no more comments on this? No, no, Great. I'll leave, leave that to bed. <laughs> Great. Um, then I think, um, seeing as we're a little bit over time already, um, we are going to um, to close off this uh, this webinar here. Um, I would really like to uh, thank the both of you, James and Ben, for um, for these really interesting inputs, um, and to all of you who joined um, for 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 your great questions um, and and your support. And um, it's really. Um, really great to see that um, that this this idea makes people enthusiastic and it makes people um, think of of what we can do with it and, and ways we can get it implemented. Um, and so I would really like to invite all of you also to um, to stay connected um, with us um, with us and with the campaign. So we've put, we're posting the website again in the chat box. Um, so please do sign up for for our. Um, for news from us um, and and write us um, yeah and sign up for the campaign um, we um, we look forward to to working with all of you in the future on this uh, because obviously uh, we cannot do this alone we uh, we need as many people as we can get um, to get to a world citizens initiative um, so thank you all for joining uh, and have a nice evening.